A very warm welcome to a brand new season of IDFC First Bank Presents, Leaders of Tomorrow Season 12 with me, Ritwika Gupta. This is part two of our very special launch episode and today we are continuing our panel discussion that puts India in the spotlight. And also coming up tonight, we'll be chatting about women in business and much more. Let me quickly introduce my panelists. Chandrakant Salunke, founder and president SME Chamber of India. Arundhati Bhattacharya, chairperson and CEO, Salesforce. Niranjan Hiranandani, co-founder and managing director of Hiranandani Group. Manoj Kumar Vijay, managing partner Mumbai and head risk advisory KPMG India. And the Bali Goenka, CEO and managing director at Wellspun Living Limited. Wonderful story to see 7.7% in spite of the fact that there are headwinds. In spite of the fact that uh, America is on the back foot, Japan is on the back foot, China is on the back foot, Europe is completely in the back foot. Yeah. If you look at it in comparison, mm -hmm. I think we have huge advantage in taking things forward for our country. I think India can look at being the great global sourcing opportunity from uh, you know for the world, and also as as we see uh, our GDP growth and how the India is you know evolving in the terms of consumption, I think India will become a great consumption story as well. Uh, if I can put it, you know, the three big D's, which I may just incrementally add, which is a uh, advantage for India has is the demographic uh, thing that is there in India, right? The kind of population, the young population that is available. Second thing is also the whole uh, digital transformation that uh, we have embarked on mm -hmm. as in India. I think uh, the kind of smartphones and the f availability across India that is there is also driving some of the elements around that. And the point was mentioned, the destination India for some of our global uh, players outside is it's attracting right now in India geopolitics is not helping others so we are taking advantage of that in India currently there are at least you know 50 percent are manufacturing industries in MSME sector and there are you know a lot of issues particularly faced by the MSME sector that is you know not having the you know uh, reasonable rate of uh, uh, industrial land rate of interest is very high very costly easily silk skill skill man power is not available and they are facing problem to enter into emerging market by 2030 we will probably have 1 billion people uh, who will be in the workforce and uh, we would probably be supplying 25 percent of the talent worldwide that is needed for various jobs The theme for our show this season is powering entrepreneurs for the global stage. Um, and I know we have sort of answered this, you know, in, in our various questions and points. But what do you think really needs to be done, you know, to support entrepreneurs in India to enter the global market, uh, especially for MSMEs who are now aspiring, you know, uh, to actually go global, you know, from local, you know, to also overall enhance cross-border trade. Um, what's your take on this, uh, Mr. Hiranandani? Let's start with you. Well, I, I, I think, uh, as, I, as, you, as we have already discussed, a lot has been done. I think the taxation effect uh, to sole businessmen and individuals and uh, as, uh, SMEs needs to be rationalized. Yeah. You can't have uh, small M SMEs are even sole proprietorships that were working. And I think those days are gone when you can have a high tax rate and expect people to be honest. Mm -hmm. So I think that type of rationalization needs to be done for the purposes of taxation direct tax that we really need to do. The second, I think, is which is most important, as we have said, technology, skill development, which is to be done, but also the linkages to each segment is very important to educate. Uh, Nepali just mentioned about textiles. Pick up any trade. Take education, for instance. Today, education is devoid of any technology use at all. And there is so much available all over the world. During COVID, we realized how much uh, online education could be possible. Today, that is going to be used for skilling, reskilling, unskilling, and also taking it forward that you have a continuous education of all ages. People may not be able to go back to the colleges and schools or skilling centers to do so. I think online education in the, all these segments can be really enhanced. So I think education, and the last is health. I think health is still not taken a fourth point in our country, and I think a lot needs to be done. So all in all, fantastic country, love India, love Bharat, and I think a big opportunity, MSMEs are there, but I think every segment is 
beautiful in this country. Sure. Mr. Chandrakant? We have to educate MSMEs, especially entrepreneurs, to develop their you know, leadership qualities, mm -hmm. adopt the fair business practices, business ethics, and mostly we have to encourage the government officials and bankers as a, uh, to approach a positive approach to the MSME sector, mm -hmm. provide a proper ecosystem, uh, reduce the harassment by the tax authorities, provide a level playing field, bring an atmosphere where you know, industry can develop more and also encourage the young entrepreneurs, uh, new entrepreneurs to start manufacturing unit. And from that, if we identify the emerging uh, companies, emerging MSMEs, then only we can produce and we can showcase to the local and global market leaders of tomorrow. These leaders of tomorrow will be become a tomorrow's corporate. Sure. Arundhati? So, you know, globally, if we need to be a global company, you have to also understand that the nitty-gritties of business, they need to be taken care of. Only having a great idea and the ability to sort of sell it to uh, people here in the country is not enough. You need proper awareness of risk. You need proper governance practices. You need to have very superior understanding of the fact that, you know, a contract is a contract. And that needs to be honored in full. Uh, in full. So to that extent, you know, our, uh, our understanding of how we run a company so that it can stand scrutiny in the global situation is something that we definitely need to improve. We have talked a lot about vote governance and stuff like that. But, you know, it is still not something that I think is totally internalized in Indian businesses and it needs to be. Okay. So we have to have the right kind of practices, the right kind of business practices. Manoj? Yeah, I think from my perspective, I, we've covered a lot actually, and I think we did that. But I think what is key is, as I mentioned, the platform is there. Now we need a big mindset change of the SMEs themselves, of trying to adapt a bit of competitiveness in them and a collaboration spirit. I think that would take them to various parts of the world in a very competitive environment they'll play with. I think quality, as I mentioned, is very critical. If we have to compete outside, we cannot afford to spoil our name. So quality consciousness will be another big thing. Uh, the adaption of technology and AI, the emerging technologies we talked about could be another big thing. And probably government can still keep thinking about how we could encourage exports, mm -hmm. further incentivizing on taxes, etc. An important point uh, was discussed on the SME listing. Mm -hmm. I feel we have got an exchange, but how do we encourage these companies to list? What do we do? Is there an incentive we need to think through from an investor's perspective? to also help them to you know invest in IPOs of SMEs and also how do you create it more smoother for them to get listed in exchanges as well could be even give Dipali, I'll let you have the last word. So I would just say that SMEs and MSCs uh, actually form the bedrock of a country and uh, you know there's a huge opportunity here and I think an interesting aspect is about the governance, the compliance, the ecosystem, the digitization and technology. They'll play a very big role and I think corporates like us will have to give them, give them that interface and a window to the world. I think that's going to be a very important way of taking them into the global space as well. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. That was a very fruitful discussion. Thank you for being part of our launch episode for Leaders of Tomorrow Season 12. And I look forward to having a conversation like this again sometime in future. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And wish you for the episode. Thank you so much. All the best. It's time for a quick break here. We'll be back shortly. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching our very special launch episode of IDFC First Bank Presents Leaders of Tomorrow Season 12. The focus is now on empowering Indian entrepreneurs for global competitiveness to shed light on some of the key challenges and opportunities for MSMEs to scale globally. I'm now joined by Dr. Arvind Virmani, macroeconomist and member of Niti Aayog. Dr. Virmani, thank you so much for joining us. My first question. 
how do you believe uh, we can effectively empower entrepreneurs in India for them to compete on the global stage? Yeah, so uh, there are a number of factors. Uh, unfortunately, the understanding of the meaning of startups and entrepreneurship is very uh, uh, limited, I would say. Uh, though uh, the word is uh, used quite a bit and a lot of people understand uh, that uh, uh, this is critical to uh, uh, driving uh, you know, high quality growth, uh, high uh, quality employment, etc. into the future. Uh, so, so what are the, the, the key issues here which I think need to uh, uh, be, be, be corrected in a sense? So uh, one is that uh, one is connected with the regulatory organization understanding and the second is uh, with the uh, other bureaucracies, whether it's the tax bureaucracy or others, understanding. And the basic uh, problem here is uh, that uh, in India, we are used to a kind of uh, a, a, a legal rules uh, procedure-based mindset. So everything has to be clear uh, and, and uh, risk-free in a sense, zero risk. But the whole nature of entrepreneurship uh, and startups has to do with taking risk, uh, evaluating risk. So, so I think one of the uh, important things which we have to do, which is a difficult job, is for, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, training uh, regulators and bureaucrats, or at least the people who will deal uh, with uh, entrepreneurs and startups to understand the nature of risk and how to do, deal with it. I would say uh, that is the biggest challenge. You know, I have been uh, talking to a lot of entrepreneurs. I've been trying to see uh, where are uh, the blocks and the problems, but underlying all this, you know, without getting into further detail, is this uh, inability to understand risk, risk taking, and make judgments with respect to it. Sure. You know, so MSMEs encounter a multitude of challenges when they attempt to expand their presence in the global market. Um, tell us, what are some of the steps that can be taken to support them, you know, in expanding their global footprint? Uh, supply chains, you know, uh, the, the simplest uh, supply chains are uh, virtually linear, okay? So you have a, uh, uh, think of a product like a leather good. So you start from uh, the, the animal, the leather processing, uh, and cutting, etc. So it's a linear process. But any complex good, whether it's electronics, telecom, uh, electrical machinery and equipment, mechanical uh, machinery and equipment, it, it, it is not a linear process. Things can go back and forth, back and forth. So, so, so that means that the both the import and export uh, system is very important because it's not that one thing comes in and then everything is made and it goes out. So this back and forth movement means that the way you treat imports is as important as the exports. So, so in a sense, you need a reform of the whole uh, import system to facilitate uh, supply chains. But that is just one element of it. There are two other, uh, uh, you know, the opportunity and challenge, as we all know, uh, is coming from the problem that too much of global manufacturing and global manufactured exports are concentrated in one country. So the second aspect is that we have to have, we meaning India and anybody who wants to de-risk the supply chains, want to get rid of the monopoly. Uh, you know, everybody knows and we, we, we've talked about it for endlessly for 75 years, monopolies are bad. I think everybody understands that but we've allowed a monopoly in manufactured goods, many manufactured goods, to be created in one uh, large country. So, so the first thing is that China has to be treated differently, whether we call it a national security exemption or any other thing. Different countries are doing it different way. And the third part of it relates directly to your question, which is the FTAs. So, so, we, we, so we have to have a threefold policy. One is a general reform of the tariff system. Second is special uh, treatment of the monopoly producer of manufacturer. And third is FTAs with high income developed countries. Now, why is that critical? Uh, the reason is that two, almost two thirds of international trade occurs within supply chains of MNEs. 
So MNE doesn't control all parts of the su supply chain, but it controls the overall framework in the uh, and and prescribes the quality and the methods, etc., uh, of this supply chain. And most of the MNEs in this world are based in the U.S. and EU and other high income developed countries. So if we want to, because we've uh, lost this, uh, we, we've lost this opportunities in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, when all these uh, uh, multinational move to different countries, starting with Korea, Malaysia, Thailand, China, uh, now Vietnam, uh, Vietnam in the 90s, the last one, you know, in fact. So to catch up with that, we urgently need these FTAs with uh, the, the, the advanced countries, the high income developed countries. And what that me does is that if you have zero duties within that movement, which I talked about, this back and forth movement becomes much simpler. It is not just a matter of having zero duties for imports which go into exports, but the general movement of uh, goods which can come. So, so what do I mean by that? So you may get a, a small component where the parts come into India, it's reassembled and then sent back to, uh, you know, may come from US, sent back to Germany, where they put it into uh, another larger component or sub-assembly and then ship that back to India for assembling the overall product. So this back and forth movement can be within different countries. So if we have uh, FTAs, we already uh, had got one with UK, we have with Japan and South Korea, if we get FTAs with EU and other developed European countries and, uh, and some version of the FTA with US, this movement becomes uh, much easier. Dr. Virmani, The Economist published an article stating that India's economic growth figures need to be taken with a pinch of salt. Given the recent uh, debates you know, on India's GDP growth with some critics alleging uh, inflated GDP figures, tell me what's your take on our economic uh, trajectory? How do you view India's GDP prospects for the near future? So let me give you a personal answer. You know, I have dealt with India's statistics uh, and macroeconomic data for uh, roughly 50 years, okay? And when I used data and when I had a problem with it, I still remember I uh, went to or, or looked at the uh, uh, information uh, given by the NAS and S NSS about how they calculate various aspects of the GDP. Why do I say this? Uh, because when I read in the papers, what I find is they don't have a clue of how our GDP data is constructed, yet they freely and confidently criticize it. I find that very strange. Let me give you one example, okay? We, India, as a share of the economy, India has one of the largest informal sectors in the world, okay? One of the largest. I'm not saying I don't know the exact because this data is not readily available. Much of it is uh, speculative, but, you know, as a broad uh, uh, matter. So, so there are special ways of investigating or judging the uh, output of this informal sector, okay? If you take a poll of all the critics which you read and which you are referring to, I doubt that even one knows how we estimate this uh, uh, stuff, okay? Now, I know about it and let me give you one example. Uh, uh, there, there has been a, a lot of uh, discussion on the fall in investment rate from its peak. I did a paper in 2010, which is published on, uh, on a website, where I found that this particular fall is in one segment only. 90% of the decline is one area, okay? Two things, I'll, I'll give you the details if you're interested, but two things. One is not a single critic knows about this thing, Second is, I published a paper, I haven't seen one single person refer to that. So what is this mysterious thing which is so hard for critics to understand? It has to do with the what we used to call physical savings and investment. So households, their savings and investment are direct. It does not go through the financial system. The financial system is a formal part of the economy where we capture many things. 
But these critics of our GDP don't even know that there is a part which is estimated, which is the savings of the household and their direct investment in structures. What is structures? Housing. You think of residential housing, commercial. Somebody may build a shop in his residence. That is counted as savings and investment, it is physical saving and investment, and that is estimated. There is no data on this, direct data. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Virmani. Uh, we'll be airing the full conversation next week on Leaders of Tomorrow. Do tune in for that. Meanwhile, it's time to take a quick break here. We'll be back shortly. Stay tuned. Welcome back. It's now time to tune into our final segment of our launch episode today here on IDFC First Bank Presents, Leaders of Tomorrow Season 12. Now, this is a special discussion that will explore the evolution, current state and future priorities of women entrepreneurs and leaders in India. Let me quickly introduce my panelists. Ms. Naya Saghi, Group Co-Founder, Good Glam Group. Uh, Ms. Armin Mughal Dordi, uh, Chairperson, Fiki Ladies Organization, Mumbai Chapter. And Ms. Lubaina Shapurwala, Co-Founder, Ms. Tang Socks and Accessories. Thank you so much, ladies, for being with us today. Thank, Thank you for having us. So let's kickstart this discussion by uh, talking about the state of women entrepreneurship in India today. Um, how has that evolved over the years, perhaps from the time you started out? And where do we stand today, really? Uh, Naya, let's start with you. You know, I was just having this conversation yesterday with a couple of my uh, entrepreneur friends, because when I started in 2014, 2015, there were very few of us who were women and, uh, you know, entrepreneurs starting off. It was very lonely, actually. Yeah. But I think the numbers are very positively changing. Um, last count, about 18% to 20% of new startups starting up are actually started by women themselves. Um, so I think the number is the shift is happening. I think what we need to solve for is, is money going to where uh, the traction is happening, right? Because yeah. that is still an issue to be solved for. Right. Armin? So from the perspective of women entrepreneurs, I think in last de decade or so, we've seen a good growth. So around 20% of, as Naya said, 20% of women are in into entrepreneurship. And out of that, around 14% is MSME sector, which is where we need to see the scale up. Sure. Uh, flow as Fiki Flow, uh, Pan India National is what we do is we are supporting the women entrepreneurship for them to come into this, you know, to get the mentorship, to get the support. And this is the 13% that we are looking at MSME and 20% we want to see that with Flow, with other uh, partners in collaboration, we get this rate to 23 to 24% this year. So that's our thing. But yes, over a period of last 10 years or a decade, we have seen women coming there and getting that support from other partners also. So that's a good sign, at least from our, my perspective. Sure, From women coming in the in the space, I mean, women were mostly in the domestic space, right? That's what they used to do, be home. They were homemakers. Yeah. I mean, you see the growth now in, 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 um, in, in professionals as well as the businesses, but um, there's still, uh, there is a, there is a growth. Most definitely, but we are looking at uh, far, far uh, greater numbers and that for that there are several, several things that I would think that uh, if I may uh, even say that, you know, it, there has to be several more things that need to be done in terms of handholding for women within the space to grow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, Naya, you know, coming back to you, um, tell me on an individual level, right, you know, what are some of, you know, your priorities, you know, for, uh, you know, this year or probably, you know, even for women entrepreneurs, you know, what should their three to four key priorities be? And I'm coming from a space that, you know, you are one of the, you know, co-founders of a unicorn. And we don't really see that many women founders, you know, who are, you know, helming unicorns, right? Um, so tell me, what do you think uh, should, uh, you know, women entrepreneurs and leaders prioritize? You know, so um, uh, there are two pieces to this, right, Ritvika? One is about what is a personal priority to me. Yeah. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So at the group level and personal level, we've been extremely committed to, um, you know, seeing more women uh, entrepreneurs actually thrive mm -hmm. and succeed. 
uh, one big initiative we kicked off last year, as you already are familiar with, is the Mompreneurs Initiative, right? Which is where we created uh, probably Asia's largest platform to support mompreneurs at scale. We have more than one lakh mompreneurs registered in it. It's in partnership with Startup India and a bunch of other very marquee funds and uh, partners, right? You know, I want to kind of switch the narrative to say that what do women need to do needs to change to what do we need to do sure. differently, right? And I think the starting point is we need to really start thinking about where uh, the money is going to flow from and going back and saying make a business case and make a very clear case on money being invested in women actually being a more efficient use of money, right? Because I think once that narrative changes, and by the way, there's an amazing report out by DCG recently mm -hmm. that talks about how women-led startups do actually better financially and give you like a 73 cents per, you know, in dollar invested versus 32 cents per dollar invested versus male, you know, in male counterparts. Mm -hmm. So I think if you can make a business case and create success stories with facts on how well and how exponentially better women-led startups do, I think money will start flowing in that direction as well. That is something we need to really champion and bring out facts of as an ecosystem. So, um, I mean, um, I want to bring you in here, just extending the same thought, right? Um, tell me, what then should, you know, um, MSMEs, you know, that are led by women, you know, you know, what should they prioritize, you know, say in 2024 or, you know, in the coming years, right? You know, what should their three or four key priorities be? So, for women to come more forward and work in the MSME sector, there are few benefits few advantages that women should get okay the first is they should be able to get a benefit for financial benefits which a government has which they are not yet aware of so there has to be awareness for that like government mudra scheme okay there are there are government mudra scheme which is available but uh, women are not uh, not aware of that then there is direct debit schemes which are there so these schemes have to be basically informed to these women that yes these benefits are there First is that. Second is make them financially aware of their rights. What are the other rights that they have? Which again, the women at rural areas, Lubainas rightly said, is not aware of that. Then digital literacy is the most important thing. They are supposed to or they can uh, use things which they still don't have the access to. Right. So that is another, another most uh, important parameters. The fourth is the government regulations towards women uh, working uh, parameters, okay? Like for example, maternity leave, work from home, flexible hours. These things need to change for women to come because they are actually wearing multi hats. They are also a homemaker, they come to work and they also have entrepreneurship which is their focus. So these things, these together make an entire ecosystem for the women to come to board and start working. So we need to look at that. For first. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to touch on the women workforce participation in a bit, but uh, Lubaina, I want to get your thoughts on this as well. As on a personal level, I feel that um, women have to feel safe physically, emotionally, and skill wise, that they're trained, they're being trained and they're growing, right? So you create that ecosystem where you get more women in the workforce. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, but so what I see as a 2024 goals is one is digital transformation. Women need to focus on creating systems, processes and creating a structure whereby it's not dependent on people. Uh, second is sustainability and social responsibility. That's a huge, huge uh, uh, must for MSMEs today in the structure today. Because if you don't have uh, a sustainable uh, practices within your organization, it really won't grow and won't be even taken into consideration today. And third is governance and accountability and responsibility. Those are, for 2024, I think those are goals that one should look at. And of course, Armin has mentioned digital transformation. That is part of the whole systems and software and processes that you have to build to retain an organization. So for women, 2024, um, these are the goals that at least as MSMEs, they should look at to, uh, to at least grow and uh, and to and to have a name to reckon with right absolutely it's time for a quick break here we'll be back shortly stay tuned Welcome back. You're watching our very special launch episode of IDFC First Bank Presents Leaders of Tomorrow Season 12. 
You know, I think we all agree that women are the, um, you know, engines of future economic growth. But, um, you know, currently less than 20% of India's women are in the workforce. Uh, and I think that's a very startling figure, right? Um, what do you think needs to be done to encourage a significantly more uh, women workforce participation? Uh, Nayab, you know, maybe from your perspective as a leader, you know, uh, how, how do you think, what do you think, where do you think we are going wrong? As a leader, I'm currently as a second time pregnant mom. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that maternity is the biggest drop off, right? Because uh, our in, and we've shared this before in public forums, right? With regard the numbers out there, women in STEM is we have actually the highest in the world today, right? In terms of proportions of women in STEM and engineering colleges. So the input factors are all like some what getting into place. You have women toppers. You know, we've seen some very celebrated cases yeah. uh, across like, you know, the ISC and the ICSC, the class 12 exams, etc. What happens after they join the workforce? Well, what happens is that in some way, early middle career, when they, you know, get married and they have a family, uh, the support infrastructure is completely broken. You're looking at a 70, like India has changed, right? It's 70% nuclear today. So you're looking at this husband wife uh, couple that's kind of like just kind of keeping the heads up trying to manage the unit. And the woman typically takes the brunt of it. If you want to solve something, I think that is a period that really needs to solve. Um, and of course, there are a lot of like, you know, interventions we've all and we can talk about at nauseum. But I think that is the period where as, you know, a concerted, uh, I would say intervention, right? Right from the government to corporates to you know entrepreneurs to investors. We need to come together and say this is this leaky bucket we need to solve for. If that gets solved, right, Ritika, I think the entire like the part to leadership, the part to boardrooms is a very clear channel. Absolutely. Um, I mean, do you agree with? I Naya? completely agree. So today, what's happening is the maternity uh, law is 180 days. Okay, of what the law says that you can go on a maternity leave. But after that, to get women back to work is a task because there are a, the women is also not only taking care of the child, is a homemaker plus has to come back. So there has to be options given by the government to make this more flexible for women. First, then secondly, also the industry has to recognize that women who have moved out okay due to maternity due to other uh, social obligations how to get them back and for that there has to be a policy which needs to be floated which we as women have to make the make the government understand or write to them that these are the things which are required so that is the second thing that i agree with mm -hmm. and lastly what i would say is for women to be there they have to have their mentors, they have to have a circle of confidence. A lot of women move out of their businesses because they feel that they cannot make it. So that mentorship, circle of confidence and somewhere to go to. So has to be there. So that's where organizations like FIKI, organizations like CII, these are the organizations which support the women and give them the platform for this mentorship. And women should feel inclusive. A lot of uh, many cases where women don't feel inclusive, hence she's walking out of the workplace or she's walking out of the entrepreneurship space or she's even scared to take that step. From my example, I moved out from a professional to an entrepreneurship. The journey was not very simple, uh, easy. But today, yes, we have to make sure that we are there. And for that, a lot of things that we need to, the challenges we need to basically face. So for me, for me, flow, Fuki flow was really uh, organizations which help me to scale till your I absolutely agree, especially when it comes to mentorship, you know, a young working professional. I think especially for women, mentorship and leadership is something that they, you know, they seek, they seek out, right? Um, Lubaina, I want to bring you in here. What sure. is your take on this? So um, we've covered the whole bit about having to come back to work after having a baby. Yeah. And we're lucky, all of us, some of us have been lucky that we've had that spot. We got that spot back. Now, um, I, I want to divide it into four buckets. One is infrastructure. Um, you know, there be uh, as as a structure, we don't have childcare facilities, uh, senior care facilities, uh, even even washrooms, and even mobility is an issue for women, right? How do they go and come? So mobility and these things have to be uh, have to be complemented for women. Otherwise, they won't be coming to the workforce. Very simple. Look at the number of compartments in a train for men as compared to women, right? So how do you get there? So these are very important infrastructure issues that we have. Um, also, like the development plan of Mumbai, the BMC is, has done uh, centers for skill development, creches, uh, senior care, because the woman is looking after seniors or children at home. So if you have these things to facilitate a woman, she'll come more to the workspace. Second, policy. 
uh, there is a lot of things that require in terms of policy. If you notice, uh, you have a CFC, a common uh, facility center within industries and also creches. If those are also facilitated, now 30, if you have more than 30 women, it requires a creche. So most com companies will circumvent it and keep 29, right? So it has to be again supplemented by policy. Third is the mindset, mindset uh, shift. I think uh, families have to learn to be able to say, sharing the load, uh, you know, most times people will say we are helping the woman of the house. It has to be sharing the load, not helping. It's just not a support. So that also contributes to more women coming in the workspace. And the last thing I think, of course, is everybody's mentioned uh, flexible uh, working hours, mm -hmm. uh, having more uh, even parental uh, um, um, leave. That's important. So those are the four major buckets that I see. Right. Um, you know, I want to just like um, uh, take a broader take on this, the big picture, right? You know, when you're talking about women entrepreneurs, I want to understand how do biases, you know, specifically, you know, rooted in gender, right? Uh, how, how does it impact the investment landscape? You know, when women entrepreneurs are going out there seeking funding, um, do you think that influences their access to, you know, probably opportunities or funding, uh, you know, for growth when they're looking at it? Uh, Naya, uh, what has been your journey like? Absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, of course, again, the narrative is changing over time and you know nothing succeeds like success like I love seeing as well so I think the more of us who become successful and you know people see our journeys play out the more I think conviction people get that this is the norm it's not an oddity uh, but I mean I'll give you like two or three quick examples right I've had entrepreneur friends who are technical founders uh, and they've gone into pitch meetings and you know their male co-founders looked at and asked all the technical questions right because the belief uh, you know, is that women don't know technology or are not capable of, you know, running technology companies. By the way, that is a belief that we're really out to change. I'm on the governing council of the Tech Entrepreneurs Association of Mumbai. We were elected in a couple of months back and one of the biggest mandates that we're chasing is to really talk about the stories of women engineers uh, building out of Bombay and women leaders who are entrepreneurs and engineers building out of Bombay, right? So that's one big piece that I'm really, really passionate about. Uh, you know, it's another example, you know, for instance, we've had and I've personally been through situations where I fundraised in the past when I was not pregnant and still and I'm, I was a single founder in my uh, earlier after my entrepreneur 1.0 journey. And I was asked, why don't you get in a male co-founder? It will give more legitimacy, more credibility, more stability to our business. Right. Which just, you know, are the kind of narratives and the conversations you become part of. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is all changing now somewhat. But these are the experiences, if you will, that I think uh, a lot of us at different stages have come across. And, you know, we're really hopeful that that changes in time. Nibana, did you Absolutely. also face a similar? Absolutely. I truly believe because we, I've been doing this for 20 odd years. I have a co-founder who's a woman. Uh, and all... And, there is no uh, gender to gender. So at the end. But it's, uh, I have to say, it's not easy. You have to hustle, you have to struggle, and you have to stand your ground. That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I completely uh, agree. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I, have, I have worked for uh, in an industry which was male-dominated for around 20 years. And maybe I, we were only 5% women at a position which we were. And it was always a question, as Lubaina said, this is a trainer, nahi hai. you know, this is how... I have faced myself. But having said that, I feel today, as Naya said, the things are changing. But I won't say it's changing so much when you are sending, sitting for a funding round yeah. where I was on the panel. Yes, there are questions still asked that what do you think after five years, where will you be? You will be married. You will have, uh, you will have family. Because stability is, an, is a paramount importance for the funders. And they do feel that will women be able to take it forward. I just want to build on what she said. Yeah. Beautiful. Both of them beautifully yeah. said. Um, the whole aspect of community and community knowledge is super critical here. So you know, uh, we've been. I've been personally also building communities out for the last what eight, ten years now, and I'm part of many as well. And there are a couple of communities part of this female founders group, right, which comprises of some of the top founders, uh, female in India, and we discuss very openly our challenges. So we also, we're just saying saying this out loud. We have a list, a running list of investors that we've had great experiences with and investors we've not had such great experiences with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think uh, what I, investors are also getting a little bit more savvy about is that if you want to attract the best founders, you have to be the best investor as well and a very founder-friendly investor. So there's a lot of informal networks through community knowledge 
that is helping us also make better decisions on where we go to our fundraisers for. If I may add again, yeah. what she's saying that men have been doing this for years, for centuries, right? They've been the breadwinners, they've been coming home, they've been going in the evening and huddling and having a drink and discussing their wins and their losses, right? It's very recent that women have come into this area. So the, there is a there is a there is an imbalance of the demand and supply ratio. And we women also have to learn to handhold other women and say, okay, that was a failure and laugh about it, right? We, the, the, the spots are fewer still, so it's going to take it's going to take a while. But uh, it's very interesting to have have so many on board now and kind of be in this whole phase. I mean, it, your your program uh, says leaders of tomorrow, right? We need more women at these tables to be able to have this conversation and tell everybody it's going to be all right. You fall, you'll get up, mm -hmm. but you'll become stronger. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I agree. And um, you know, just by way of closing remarks, you know, I um, actually want to ask each one of you a piece of advice, you know, for all the women entrepreneurs, women, you know, aspiring leaders, you know, who are watching our show today. Um, maybe perhaps you know you could um, talk about a lesson you learned, you know, uh, but in terms of you know certain challenges that you navigated, uh, what would you like to tell them? Uh, Naya, let's start with you. I actually shared quite transparently on my LinkedIn <laughs> a post about uh, my journey through my second pregnancy. And I think I'm going to just actually use what I was introspecting there. Uh, one is, uh, you know, don't be apologetic for your ambition. In fact, embrace it, own it, think about it daily. And when you're feeling your lowest, go back to that time where you were the most ambitious you felt in your life and channel that energy, right? And make that work for you because don't forget your ambition as a woman or as a man for that matter. And number two, just please remember you're not a sacrifice. I think when I use that term on my post, we, I got so many messages because I think we're so used to saying, oh, you know, we can't do this because, or you're expected to not do it, right? But you are not the sacrifice, like get that out of your head. Uh, and focus on your ambition, focus on your dreams, your passion, your vision, and make it work and ensure it works. So that's what I'd leave people with. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, I would say be resilient. Follow your dreams and don't give up under any circumstances. These are the three mantras which if you follow, be it men, women, but for women, be resilient is 100% a go-to because that's where if you are resilient and you follow your goals, you are going to go there. Okay. So this is something which I have followed and I would say all women, women out there, be it an entrepreneur, be it working, be it in a small scale industry, micro or anywhere, even at, as, as a homepreneur, follow your dreams and you will be there. Fantastic. Um, be ready to let go. I mean, um, by let go, I mean, let go of the failure. You fail, you fall, you close, you move ahead, learn to pivot um, and, and, you know, uh, become stronger through your um, through all your mistakes and I think the second would be that you know become risk takers women as such have to learn to take calculated risks business risks and 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 take a risk and and take the plunge yeah well I think that was a fantastic discussion ladies thank you, thank you so much for joining us today and I think our viewers will have a lot to take away thank you so much thank, thank, you, thank you for having thank us you. here pleasure well, we truly hope you enjoyed both part one and part two of our season 12 launch episodes. Don't forget to write to us, tell us what you like, what you'd like to see on the show. We'll be experimenting a lot with our formats and bringing you interactions with names who are making an impact. Tune in to Leaders of Tomorrow every Monday to Friday on ET Now at 7.30pm. See you.